Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, we're going to be speaking with Jenny Tinmouth, who is an English motorcycle racing competitor in the British Superbike Championship as a Honda-supported rider. She is the current female Isle of Man TT lap record holder, for which she gained a Guinness World Record. Jenny is also the first and only female competing in the British Superbike Championship. Jenny, hello, how are you? Hi Sarah, I'm, I'm really good, thank you very much. Oh brilliant. Jenny, this is absolutely phenomenal. I just love what you've achieved in this sport. It's absolutely fantastic, you know, how you're doing it and what you're doing. And I can't wait to talk to you about it in more detail. But I'd love to go back really to sort of your childhood and just find out a little bit more about you and what you were into as you were growing up. So was this, was motorsport something that was in and around your family or was, or how did it come to fruition growing up i was um i was very much a, a tomboy and i sort of i, I liked playing out with my, like my best best mate and we used to just climb trees and uh, make mud pies and do all the kind of tomboy kind of things and uh yeah my um my dad's always had a motorbike and my cousin sort of raced cars a little bit and just generally sort of the influences on tv at the time as well so there was quite a lot of programs that involved cars or motorbikes there's like the a-team night rider airwolf uh street hawk all these kind of programs that were all sort of car or motorbike based and always driving fast and always chase scenes and things like that and uh also my, my parents quite heavily into watching formula one at a weekend so it's sort of like a thing that we did every every other sunday was watch formula one race so yeah just being in and around bikes and in and around cars and also the, sort of being a bit of a tomboy that was kind of the way i i kind of went and the things that influenced me when I was younger I guess so and do you, do you have any brothers or sisters or were you an only child no I've got a older brother he's two years older than me but he's a uh, he's definitely got the brains of the family and slightly went down a more sensible path than me but yeah when did you first start racing then when did it happen uh, well I left school after doing my a-levels so like 18 and um I wasn't really too sure what I wanted to do I I mean I took business studies and art at school and I thought I wanted to go and do like graphic design or something with my art but I didn't really know where to take it. And I went and looked at a couple of colleges and I didn't really fancy the courses they had. And then, I mean, I'd, at that time, I'd got my bike license anyway, because I just, at 17, I did my CBT, got my bike license, um, got a little 125 on the road and was already sort of riding around on a bike. Did you get a driving license as well? Or did you just get your motor- bike license first? Um, bike license first, yeah, straight straight to the bike. Took probably, I think it was about four years before I got my car license after that. So my dad had a couple of bikes anyway so he was using his for work you know to drive for, to work and back and he had a couple of classic bikes as well AJ and AJS and a matchless and we used to go to the AJS and matchless owners club rally every August you know there's no sort of issue with me getting a bike it was just so it's almost um, like a natural progression more than anything yeah. else and they were quite supportive did you pass yeah. your test first time no I failed <laughs> <laughs> I was gutted I took him um, he said that I took well, the wrong lane. It was like a three-lane roundabout, and he said I took the wrong lane on the roundabout, even though I disputed that. But yeah, no, he's gutted. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, past second time. <laughs> you've passed. You've got your license. You've done your A-level business studies and art, which I did as well, actually. And then try to decide what to do next. So yeah, what happened after that? I mean, I was still watching the motorsport at the time on TV and discovered that there was a local racetrack to me that was ace. And I just used to keep going up there to see what was going on and go there with mum to watch races. And then I got interested in how the combustion engine worked so basically the innards of an engine how, how everything functions and obviously learning how to look after my own bike as well and just got really interested in that and I thought well I'm gonna go have a look at a motorcycle maintenance course at college and join just joined a three-year college course so I had I was working two jobs at the time and did my college course which luckily I sort of snuck on during this sort of mostly the first year nearly finished so I managed to sort of fast track the course and did it in two years and then the, se- the second year I, I basically applied for a job at my local dealership I just said I didn't to be fair I didn't think they'd take on a girl I don't know why I thought that but I didn't think they would and I just said if if I will you take me on if I work for free at weekends and um luckily enough they took me on and then I got a full-time job from there so when, so, you, when you were at college were you the only girl um, doing it or no there was I think there's four, four or five other girls there's quite a few girls on it actually and it was good it was um quite a good mix of girls and boys so yeah so you've done the course 
and you've learned all about like motorcycle maintenance. You're now working at a local dealership. Why didn't you think they'd take a girl on? I didn't know of any other female mechanics. My sort of conditioning growing up as well, you just general in general society, you don't see a girl do something. So I think I I just subconsciously thought, well, I'm not sure if they're going to actually, I've never seen a female mechanic. I'm not sure if they're going to take one on. That's probably just my own naivety and quite a shy girl anyway. So I think that sort of contributed to it. So I think if I was a lad, I might have offered to work for free anyway, just because I was a little bit shy and not sure they'd take me on anyway. So yeah, not necessarily just because being female if you know what I mean. I think it is interesting what you said there about how that you've never really seen like a female mechanic so you didn't actually know if if women did that and I think that's actually almost part of the problem when women don't know that you can do do these traditional male roles when actually you can do there's nothing stopping you from doing it. So how was it working at the local uh, dealership? Yeah it was great I I loved it obviously I was completely in my element working on bikes so it was fantastic and I'd managed to finish off my college course being at the dealership as well, because the last year of the college course was a lot of um, hands-on dealership work. So that sort of worked out really well. And then I got a full-time job from there. So, yeah, and I was there for five five, five years. But, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. How did you then move from that into the racing side of things? How did your career sort of progress? Because I'd watched all the, again, watching all the motorsport on TV and watching my cousin race and thinking he was great. And I thought, again, it's another sort of thing that I thought, I'm not supposed to be able to do this. I don't know how to do it and I don't know how to start, but I really want to do it because I really enjoy sort of the speed of riding my bike. And so I think all the sort of natural progression of finding out how to look after my own bike, getting a job so I could fund my own racing. And then the dealership that I joined, the guy who owned it used to race at the Isle of Man, TT. And there was uh, one of my colleagues in in the workshop was racing at the time as well. So I, I basically just said to him, you know, how do you start? What do you do? And he gave me... Uh, ACU license form which is the competition license form you need in the UK just basically to go and go and start start off as an, of an as a novice r- road racing so I'd I'd saved up while well, I was at college saved up for a year to buy um a little VFR 400 which I'd sort of planned to use on the road and use on track days as well and go racing so yeah I got the license off him and then sort of went from there really have you been had you been going to like track days before this and sort of uh, racing around the tracks well, look, luckily, again, the dealership I worked for ran um, their own track days at Anglesey Race Circuit. I used to go go and help, you know, go out. Lots of staff used to go and help on track days. And um, luckily enough, could just basically go out on the track day for free, just just have a blast around. So just used to ride up on my 400 and go for a blast. And then, yeah, so did quite a few track days up at Anglesey Circuit and before what, I started racing. And what's the atmosphere like on a track day when, when you're there? Great. Just like everyone's obviously really enjoying themselves and the biking community is just great in general anyway so yeah it's just really really good you've got so you've now you've got your your license which i you know obviously need to go and do racing so when was your first sort of professional race is that how it works so you have to do you do amateur races first to score points to get into a professional race or can you just go and enter a professional race what's the what's the way that you do it uh, well, there's quite a few clubs in your local area. So for my area, being northwest of England, there's uh, the Wirral 100 and Crew in Nantwich and a few other clubs. So basically, you you join a club and you can go to their their race series. So they'll normally run six or seven races during the course of the season from March to October. And yeah, basically, you take your license along. Um, start off as a novice. So you have to wear an uh, orange bib just to kind of indicate to everyone else on track that you're a novice and you compete in 10 races and once you've done that you just get a signature after the race from the the club to say that you've competed in that race and finished and then yeah 10 races and you can move up to to, um, clubman so get rid of your orange novice bib and move up to clubman and what happens after clubman i can't remember properly but i think it's you have to finish in the top 10 of the next 10 races and then once you've done that again you get a signature to say you've done those 10 races and you finished you know your result was this and then from Clubman, you move to a uh, national license then. So it's another 10 races down the line, you get your national license. And then national means that you can race in a British championship race up from the from the club. Yeah. When did you realise that actually that you were pretty good at this? Or, um, or I, did that did that happen while you were going to all these track days and, you know, move, moving up? Did you think, actually, I've got some skills here? It never sort of worked like that. I kind of had a secret, secret knowledge that I was just going to be good. <laughs> 
sounded really bad. But I was like, I'm going to go and I'm going to go win. I mean, there was no, I didn't know if I was going to. I was probably going to. And to be fair, in the first few races, I was awful. And I fell off quite a lot. But I just, in my head, I was like, I'm going to be so good at this. And just there wasn't any point when I went, actually, I'm quite good because it's quite a big learning curve, to be fair. But now I had a bit of inner burning determination and sort of quite a bit of ambition that I just thought, I love this and I'm going to be good. Yeah, it's funny. It didn't really work like it. Didn't really work the other way around. Did you ever tell people about your ambition? No, again, I think because if you just, if I fell flat on my face, I didn't really want people to know. So now I kept it sort of all within of what I wanted to do and how far I thought I could go with it. Just because I, di- I didn't know if I could. So I didn't want to be a, check me out, I'm going to go and do this and then fall massively flat on my face. So I, yeah, I just thought I will, I'll go and have a go and I'll have a good go. And whatever will be, will be. Because it's so much fun anyway. So if it did all, if it didn't work out and I did fail, which I did many times, I was enjoying it anyway. So and I tried to do something that I didn't think I could do. So yeah, it was good. When you had this like this secret ambition and this secret knowledge that you know you wanted to do this, how big were you thinking? Were you were you thinking that you just wanted to win the races and to be fast? Were you thinking that you wanted to be? the first female British racer in the sport. How big were you thinking? Um, well, it wasn't... To be honest, the female aspect didn't come into it at all. I never thought I want to be the first female to do this or first female to do that. I just... I saw myself... Because I was... Again, like I said, I was very much a tomboy. I just saw myself as one of the lads completely. So I did used to go and watch British Superbike Championship at, at Alton with my mum. I started off in one... Well, I had my 400, but I sold that quite quickly and got a little 125. So I was racing 125s. And I remember watching, standing outside the track, weighing up the 125 class, thinking, hmm, I wonder if I entered this where whereabouts I would be. And just sort of aiming, aiming to get in there. And it's sort of, it's, it's sort of a progression because it's quite an expensive sport and you, you have to weigh up what equipment you've got and how hard you think you're trying and how well you're doing and where you think you might be and where you can get to. And I always had an ambition to go as far as I could go. First one was to get into British One Two Five Championship, and then try and get into Super Sport, and then try and get into Super Bike. So, so do you think your ambition yeah. grew as basically you sort of got more confidence as you um, as you started racing? Like the ultimate ambition for British Super Bikes was always there, but you can never actually know if you're ever going to get there or not, kind of unless you unless trial and error and a progression on the way. But my dream was to race in British British Super Bikes for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had to suss it out as I was going as to whether I'd, I'd get there or not. <laughs> Absolutely. And and you said that you were one of the lads. Did you ever experience any sexism while you were going up the ranks? Were people, you know, was it very supportive and inclusive or what was that aspect like being one of the girls or one of the lads? Um, yeah, I didn't see any. There was no sexism at all. Like the mo- motorcycle racing in general and the motorcycle community, community is just lovely and they just they welcome, welcome me with open arms. You know, the, most people that I met would just do anything to help and you know, if you crashed, people would help you with spares. And um, like somebody let me a crank at Cadwell Park when my, my engine blew up. And then, um, no, they're just really, really good. Nothing really, any element of your girl, you shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. There was none of that at all. It's just dead friendly, dead helpful. A lot of the guys are chuffed a bit to see a girl doing it and want more girls to do it. So, yeah, um, yeah it was really good. I love hearing stuff like that. I love it when it's about that, that community and helping each other and wanting to see people progress. So what was your first big race, your first big championship race? Well, I moved into MRO at the time. That was quite a big, big what, race. What, what's MRO? The, um, MRO is sort of a, it, it's what's called the Thundersport now, but previously it was called MRO Championship. But it was sort of an in-between class between club racing and British Championship because a lot of the British Championship riders were doing the MRO Championship as well. If you were trying to get to British Championship but were just coming out of club level, it was kind of a good intermediate class to kind of weigh up if you were fast enough and could compete with the British guys because the MRO Championship like had a grid of 40, 40 one, two, five riders and a good probably 70% of those were from British Championship so they were quite big races really they were sort of like mini mini British Championships. And talk us through yeah. your first big race. I mean I was awful but <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> Why were like, you awful? There a, yeah there's a lot of really good riders in like Casey Stoner was in it at the time and the reigning British champion at times, like Steve Patrickson and uh, a lot of other, you know, really, really good guys. It's just good because you get to kind of see what sort of level you need to be at and how fast you actually need to go. 
yeah, I just loved every minute of it. And how did you do in that race? Um, I, yeah, that's sorry, that is the awful part. I did <laughs> awful because uh, I think I was like right down probably low thirties. I was yeah, it was so hard. You just it's just such a step up from club racing to a national championship race. The you know the level of talent in the race is a lot higher, and the lap times you need to get to finish high up a lot higher. And so I didn't I didn't finish very well, but it's that's just where I wanted to be. I always wanted to put myself into a harder championship just to bring up my own level of riding to compete against the guys that are really quick. So Absolutely. yeah, it, yeah, I only say awful in respect of my result, not <laughs> not the race itself. I really enjoyed it. So. What are the skills that you need to be a good rider? If you start off in the low classes, like the 125s, it's not necessarily about fitness quite so much. You, you know, you have to have a level of fitness, but you can get away with not being, you know, you don't have to do a lot of training because the bikes are very light. To to be a good rider, you just have to have a lot of determination and, yeah, a bit of an adrenaline junkie that likes the speed and doesn't mind the odd crash every now and again. And Yeah, just that, obviously that competitive spirit to get out there and have a go um but as you move up to the, you know the higher classes you need all of that but you, the fitness starts to come into it because the bikes get heavier and they have more power and um you're traveling at faster speed so you need to brake harder and that takes quite a lot of energy so yeah as, as i moved up to 600 and now to 1000 cc definitely the fitness is kind of coming into it now you, you mentioned about crashing like have you ever had any bad crashes i've had a few i had um uh, at angles, actually, I broke both my wrists at the same time. That was quite a nasty one. I had to have a plate in in my left wrist, and then I re I re broke it again below the plate. Oh. Uh, the next, I think it was the next year. Um, so again, I had that was a, a slight a bigger one. I had a I broke so I broke my arm, the left arm again, my right collarbone and my left ankle. So how many um, broken bones have you had? <laughs> <not too> <laughs> So what's it what's it like? Do you know that you're going to crash? Or do you have that like that sense before you crash of like, oh my god, I'm going to crash, or does it all happen too quickly? What goes through uh, your head? It, yeah, generally it happens too quickly. There aren't that many occasions where you know you're going to have a crash. It sort of it just happens, and you're you're concentrating on trying to go fast, and then you know next thing you've you've come off in some way. In that respect, I guess it's quite good because you don't have that fear of of ine- inevitability. You just the crash happens, and you have to deal with it instantly and I have had tons tons of crashes in my time and <laughs> most of them I mean our protective gear these days is so good you can bounce down the road at over 100 mile an hour and be fine so yeah I've had numerous crashes <laughs> and uh and then most of the time they're fine and actually it's quite good fun <laughs> which, which sounds bad but it is but you said you you deal with it instinctively so how how do you deal with a crash you just you don't have a great deal of time to think about it but the more the more I've had now, dependent on the crash, you can try and like flatten your body out as you slide in so that you don't tumble. Because sometimes when you tumble, that's when you injure yourself. So you can be a little bit aware, but it, it depends on the, the type of crash you have. Um, like if you have what's called a high side, where you basically just go straight up in the air and straight back down, you don't have... I mean, you could be in the air thinking this is going to hurt when I land, but <laughs> you don't you don't have much time to sort of position your body because it's... You have no idea of what you could be upside down, the right way up, sideways. You kind of lose all all sense of where you are. So yeah, and again, like I say, it happens that fast that you you just do whatever instinctively comes to you. So if you like with my crash when I broke my wrist, I guess I must have instinctively put my hands out to save myself. Yeah. So th- <laughs> things like that, you you can sort of think about once you've experienced that kind of crash. You could know not you can you know you could try and land on a shoulder rather than both hands or. It depends on the crash. If it's, most of the time it's that quick. You don't have time to think about it. So you said it takes determination, speed, a competitive spirit, the love of adrenaline and going fast. So you've got all of this. You're moving through the ranks. Can you take us back to your first ever Isle of Man TT and talk us through what happened at that race? Yeah, my first one was in 2009. It was just a good race week, really. We'd had a week of practice and... I was just getting used to the track and where it went. I rode um, a super sport bike, which is 600 and a fire blade as well, on the fire blade, 1000 cc. So yeah, it was on that bike that I um, broke the record on. It's just uh, over the moon really to do it. I it was just progressively getting faster and faster all week. Um, I started off pretty steady really, to be fair, because it's, obviously it's quite a, a long circuit to learn. I was just trying to get my head around it all week, learn the track, figure out where I was going and how fast I could go and building up speed sort of steadily and then 
to do the break the lap record, yeah, I was over the moon. You know, couldn't couldn't believe when I came back and um, Brad, my mechanic, my business partner as well. He he said you'd broken it, so yeah, I was chuffed. Can can I just sort of get you to set the scene? So, what is why is the Isle of Man so amazing for for super bikes and racing? It's a street track, so it's thirty seven and three quarter miles of roads, which once the race is finished, you know, the public are back on the roads and you can ride the track yourself. Um, so it's it's hedges, it's walls, it's trees, people's houses. You're going through towns and villages absolutely flat out at 180. And it's an amazing track. It's a dangerous place as well because if it goes wrong, it can go wrong quite in, in a bad way. So it's it's quite a, a different discipline to the short circuit racing. The short circuit racing, you, you can literally try and throw yourself down the road at every opportunity to go as fast as you can. Whereas the Isle of Man, you've got to concentrate so hard and be so precise and obviously trying to avoid curbs and there's grids and all sorts of things in the road as well and different canvas and jumps so it's a huge discipline it's basically riding around on a road for 37 three quarter mile as fast as you can possibly go concentration wise it takes it out of you you know physically and mentally to do the whole the whole race the one that did the lap record in is a six lap race so you're on the bike quite a long time and um it's probably the best fun you can have on a bike <laughs> Had you raced there before that you before you went in 2009? Was that the first time that you'd ever been on the track? No, it was the first time. So luckily enough, the um, the government, the Alman government and the organiser, the TT, take uh, newcomers over. So we went over for quite a few times before I raced there with um, Milky Quail, who's the rider liaison officer. And he takes us around the course. So we did quite a few laps in a car and just to get to learn where it went. And I, I basically videoed he did he's brilliant because he's raced it himself he knows every inch of the course so he does like a running com- commentary of the whole course while you're sitting in the car and he's explaining where you want to be what gear you want to be in and um, what you're aiming for you know picking picking out trees on the side of the road that you're aiming for as a kind of an apex and things so i basically recorded what he said and then when i came back home just sat and learned it for probably three or four months so you've got this video you've got this recording and that became part of your preparation for the three or four months before the race what other things did you do to prepare the biggest thing was learning the circuit i tried to do like a name association so i learned the names of the corners um kind of i took a picture of off that corner and then tied that up with what milky said of what sort of gear you want to be in and where you want to be and what you're aiming for and then just tried to remember it sort of in stages so what well, it's good actually once you start remembering each corner it kind of they sort of fall into a natural progression and the the circuit ends up breaking up into kind of three sort of sections so you've got like the first section mountain section and the end and and it comes easier to learn so but yeah the biggest definitely the biggest thing of going there and racing the circuit is no circuit knowledge so knowing the course knowing where it goes once you've got that done then it's building up your speed and working out how fast you can actually go through the corners and how do you take that? So when you first get there, I, so I think you said that there's like, a, is there a practice week before the actual race takes off? Yeah, there's a full week of practice and they do, for the novices, they, they take you out on like a con- controlled lap. So like Milky Quail does does one of those controlled laps, you follow like an ex-racer that's, you know, rode there a lot of times and you'll basically sit, There's it'll take about six of you. So you, you'll just sit behind him and follow him for the whole circuit. So in that respect, it's brilliant because you're not just sent out on your own to go crazy straight away or they let you you're doing a really fast lap you know they're not they're not hanging around and you but you've got somebody to keep your eyes on and follow around the track but yeah i remember doing that lap with i couldn't stop grinning i just had this massive <laughs> grin. <laughs> i couldn't i was like oh my god i'm on the track <laughs> just massive yeah massive grin on my face and then once he comes in you've done your one lap that's it then you're free to go off on your own and enjoy yourself so and, and can you do as many laps as you want as practice or are you limited like are you, are you given like certain hours like you can only have like two hours a day on the track or how does that work yeah it is i think it is two hours like from six to eight in the evening so basically you can just squeeze in as as much as you can so some laps you, some nights you can get three three laps in but on average you know it's two or three so uh yeah there is kind of a time scale of how much you can practice and it is in the evening so yeah, like they'll send out different classes. So they'll send out the solos or they'll, they'll send out lightweight class and newcomers and then they'll send out sidecars. So yeah, but basically you want to get in as much mileage as you can. So, you know, most people will go out on their like super stock bike, come in, do a quick swap to super bike and go back out and then maybe a swap to the super sport bike and go back out and just try and set up your suspension and just get mileage under your belt to get yourself back used to the track and dialed in kind of thing. So after you've had your week of practice, how are you feeling like mentally inside? Were you feeling quite confident? Were you feeling quite nervous? A mixture of both, I think. Just quite a lot of excitement. Sort of nervous excitement, really, because obviously you're quite nervous. 
mean, everyone gets nervous when they're racing anyway, and but excitement because you're riding around the best track in the world. So I had quite a good practice week, to be fair. The weather was quite kind to us, so we got quite a few laps in. And yeah, I was just absolutely buzzing, sort of looking for looking forward to the races. How does the race work? Um, it's it's one person at a time, so uh, it's every ten seconds, and you're kind of based on your practice times. So based on the lap times you've achieved in practice, sort of sets you up for where you start start off. So there'll be practically 100 competitors go off and you know the fastest guy will be off first or actually to be fair the top top i think it's the top six or ten can choose what in which order they kind of want to go but the rest of us are sort of seeded on based on your previous lap time yeah and then everyone just goes off ind- individually 10 second interval and some you know, the next person will go off so like for me for my first race i was quite i think i was off at 74 so it's quite far the back builds up your anticipation because you can see the line of riders in front of you and You've got the first guy going off and you can you can hear him set off and the bike screaming down Brain Hill and you're sort of you're sitting in a queue waiting to go, so it builds up quite a lot of um of nervous sort of anticipation. But yeah, it's great. It's really good. And you mentioned about the nerves and how you always sort of get a little bit nervous before before going out for a race. How do you handle those nerves? What tips and advice do you have for that? I guess I just funnel it funnel it into sort of a positive energy really because I mean if you didn't get nervous I think there'd be something wrong because you know you're in a race and you want to do well and it's it could be scary you could crash or it could, you know also it could go well and you just sort of all hyped up and I mean I don't want to get too nervous it, it takes over so I just try to sort of funnel it into a positive thing for the race and just make the best of the nerves and kind of enjoy the nerves because they're going to come so you just enjoy them and use them to hopefully un- enhance your performance if you can. Absolutely. I like that. Just enjoy them and, and enhance your performance. You've got this line of riders, one going off every 10 seconds. You've got the noise in the background. You're on one of the best tracks in the world. You're out in the Isle of Man. You've had a really, really good practice week. Talk us through what it felt like as you were going round doing the lap when you were, when it counted, when it was part of the race. What was that like? Um, it's funny actually you end up going into a proper your own little bubble you're just concentrating so hard so you all you're thinking about is trying to go trying to maintain your speed at all time and concentrating on where you need to be on the track and what's coming up next basically there's a running commentary going through your head during that the whole entire lap and you just sort of zone off into your own little your own little world of concentration if you know what i mean so you're thinking right i need to be here what's coming up next and you sort of don't roll off don't roll off keep it keep it pinned and yeah what gear you want to be in and where you want to be and and then you're thinking i need you know maintain your momentum because you want to keep your lap time and and there's all sorts of things also you got to think about pit stops as you know your bike load the fuel only lasts for two two laps in your bike so you've got to remember to come in there's a few occasions where you can be so sort of concentrating that you completely forget you've got to come in for a pit stop so that's quite important and just settling into the race and enjoying it when did you realise that you'd actually broken the record? It's quite hard to get a lap time when you're out there. But do you know, do you sort of think, you know, I'm going really quick here, like, oh, wow, this is on the verge of scary, I'm going so fast. <laughs> no, it's it's a funny thing. That it's seemingly the smoother and the easier it feels, the faster you're going when you're sort of fighting the bike and fighting yourself. And you feel like, crikey, I must be absolutely flying because I'm on the edge. Quite often, it's not the case and it's actually, it's actually the opposite and like the smoother and easier it's it's coming to you, the faster it is, and that's that's what's happened to me. When the easiest lap was my fastest lap, I think it's just when you've got it, you've got you sort of got in your flow, and you're just hitting all the bits that you need to hit, and everything's coming easy to you. That's sort of that's the best time. Two thousand and nine, so an amazing achievement, your, your first ever TT race, and you get this Guinness World Record. How did that impact on your career? Did it open many doors for you? Lots of people kind of took notice and. It's such a big race and it doesn't really matter where you finish. If you've gone and done that race and you, even if you've rocked in last, you know, it's a massive achievement and you've done something that not, you know, not that many people have done and you get a lot of credit and acknowledgement for doing it anyway. So yeah, I think just the fact of going over and doing it, lots more people knowing who you are and what you're doing just because it's so huge. You know, it's, it's known worldwide and it's so popular and it's such a historic race. Yeah, definitely, you know, people will be more aware of you than, than they were before. How old were you at this point when you um, when you won that? Oh, crikey. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> were you a professional at this point or are you still an amateur? Still an amateur. Yeah, I've only been sort of, well, not really, I'm not sure if I even class myself as professional now, but only really in the last <laughs> couple, couple of years have I been professional. So. Yeah, definitely. It's still an amateur just running 
running myself and my own bikes. So, yeah, own little, own little team. Okay, actually, you went back in 2010 and you broke it again. So you broke your own world record and yeah. got, got another Guinness world record. And the, the second time you went back, how did you feel as you went back? Were you feeling more confident because you've raced there before? Were you going to break the record? What What was the plan in 2010? Um, yeah, I did. I definitely felt more confident going back, having having done it once before, and there wasn't really any plan. It's, well, my approach to the race anyway was having no plan. It was just literally to go enjoy myself as much as possible, and what will be will be. So it wasn't like a definite. I'm going to go over there and try and do this. It was more go and enjoy it, and if it if it comes to you, it comes to you, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, that was basically it, and I just went there and tried to enjoy myself. And luckily enough, again, that was the last race of the, of the week. Just um, had a really good lap, and it was lucky enough to to break it again. Although you're saying you don't have a plan, but actually going out there and having fun is actually a bit of a plan because I suppose if you're going out to have fun, you're feeling more relaxed, you're feeling more happy, so there's less stress, there's less tension, and therefore you're most probably feeling a lot calmer and more more sort of settled. So actually, yeah, that- yeah, you, yeah, you're right. It is at, at the race you sort of know that that's what you need need to go fast anyway. So that is um, it is yeah, that is sort of a plan. A plan, but not a plan. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a because you do know that you need to be relaxed and you need to be chilled out to be able to go fast. So if you if you go there with a plan to do that, then like I say, hopefully it'll all work out and everything else comes and come to you. A lot of women who are successful, whether that's in sport or, or business or whatever it may be, they have certain habits that they do or daily routines that they follow. Do you have any you know any good habits that you follow that? Do you mean like sort of a a race ritual before a race or yeah. just in general? You, well, I'm, I'm interested in both actually, but what about I, before a race? Do you, what are, what are the habits or what's the ritual before you go through before you before you race? I don't really have any particular ritual that I do. Just obviously, I just make sure I've I've eaten a couple of hours before and I've, I've got enough sort of fuel and fuel in my belly and try to be a bit rested. And yeah, there's nothing. I don't have any particular sort of. I have to put my socks on a certain way or anything like that. So yeah, nothing in particular. Just sort of the the usual general stuff. Just. Make, like I say, making sure I've eaten the right, the right food and I'm pretty rested and I'm, my head's in the right place to think about what I'm going to do. And, and what is this, what food are you eating? To be fair, I'm normally on porridge. <laughs> Just fueled up on porridge. Slow it's, release uh, of energy. And you've had, well, 16 wins during your racing career so far. Which has been the most challenging race for you for whatever reason? Um, the TT is definitely a challenging one. That was because of the nature of what it is. It's a huge challenge, you know, it's a massive sort of climbing Everest kind of thing to do it. There was one season actually where I basically had absolutely no money whatsoever. And um, I was sort of really despondent because it, well, it was 2005 and I was absolutely broke. But I thought if I could make, if I could finish the year, it would have been a massive achievement. That was probably one of the most challenging years. And I did, I nearly gave up racing at that point because at the end of the season, because I, my results were so awful because my, my bike was so slow. I just borrowed all my tires, took the tires off the scrap pile at, at Dunlops and, Managed to scrounge a few pistons and think bits and pieces, and my bike was so slow, and I just was just paying for the fuel to get there and do the race and get back, and because I, I didn't really want to give up, and I thought, well, if I can take the, the challenge of just even getting to each race as a plus, then that's what I'll do, and that was a that was a really hard season because it, it was quite demoralising. So, how did you pull yourself through that? I mean, that must have been really tough when it is such an expensive sport you've got you've got no money, and you know you're scrounging around for 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 scraps for for your bike hugely hugely tough how did you get through that i, I gave myself a target because i thought if i can do the year then i know in my heart heart I've, I've achieved a massive thing that i don't think lots of people would have even tried to do they did just not got that this is my challenge I'm, i can't exactly you know challenge myself to try and win or anything but literally if i can get to every british round and finish then that that's done and i kind of i don't know why but i thought i thought somebody might notice and somebody might help and then i I had the massive realisation at the end of the year that no one was going to help, and no one would notice. And because my results had been so bad, people were even less likely to notice. So I had to sort of give myself a kick up the backside and think, well, nobody's noticed. I'm chuffed to have made it at the end of the year, but if I'm, I'm either going to have to give up or I'm just going to have to fight a bit harder to carry on going. And um, yeah, I just kind of pulled myself together and thought, right, I'm going to have to just crack on and try and get some sponsors and try and get some money and try and get, get you know, get going. And um, I took the positive of actually finishing the season I thought well that, that's an achievement in itself and it was it was that bad that my like the crank crank cases on my on my engine even there's something called a reed valve on the 125 where the the carburetor goes on and that cracked and I just kept getting it welded up for like half season it just 
I'd had it welded and welded. And when we took the engine out of the bike on the last race, it actually fell into three pieces. <laughs> it was that bad. <laughs> so I was like, I can't, I'm, I'm chuffed I've even managed to finish. So, <laughs> but yeah, it was quite a good, it was hard, but it was a good sort of learning year where I realized, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to pull my finger out and find my own way and try harder, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do it. In a way, what you just said, so you found out that no one was going to help you. You were going to have to to help yourself, basically, which actually sometimes, although it's, it's, it can be a tough experience to go through, it's almost in a way, I'd imagine, quite liberating. So what changed for you in 2006? Was that the year it turned around for you or did, was it another year where you, where you really struggled? It was another struggle year. It wasn't as bad as 2005 because I'd sort of pick myself up a bit. 2005 was the year I started my own business with my business partner, Steve. And so we were just trying to drag a bit of money together and I'd gone and pestered a few people for sponsorship. So I'd found a bit, I'd found a little bit of sponsorship. And there was a guy actually called Andrew Hensley who, who sort of found me and helped me as well. So I was lucky in respect. I say no one's going to help. And luckily enough, I did have some people come and help and I managed to pick myself up and carry on and. 2007 was my best my best season on 125s and then I moved to 600s in 2008 but yeah it's it's always tough it never got sort of the dream of just plonked on the best bike ever you, you have to fight for it all the way so so you mentioned that you started your own business what business did you start um it was motorcycle mechanic business so I'd been at a dealership for quite a few years and me and Steve just decided to go and set, set up on our own. So, yeah, literally just fixing motorbikes, all sorts of bikes as well, anything from scooters up to sports bikes. You're following your passion, you're fighting for it, and you started to get a little bit of sponsorship. What happened after that? Uh, it was just every year, you sort of build on each year. So, drawing a little bit of sponsorship, try and get better results, and then do the same again, you know, just try and sort of progress to a better bike try and get a few more sponsors so just all, all that sort of thing really. so with sponsorship do, do you find have you found it really challenging getting sponsorship and is that because because you're a woman in the sport or just because the sponsorship is difficult for everybody in the sport to get how does how does that work it's difficult for everybody to to get and depending on your personality as well sort of reflects whether you're good at getting it or not and i'm pretty awful at getting it because i i don't like asking and i don't like I feel bad asking. I've sort of always thought you need to get a job and earn your own way and pay for it yourself and find it quite hard to, you know, asking people for for help and being quite shy and not sort of that forthcoming as well. I found difficult. So I'm not sure it's, you know, it's a woman thing or anything. It's interesting though, if you are a shy person and you don't, you don't feel that com- comfortable about asking people for, for money to do something that you love and are, and are passionate about. It can be, it can be very, very difficult. But how did, how did you get over that fear? Or are you, are you still getting over that? Or are you still learning to embrace asking for sponsorship? A lot better than I used to be. And I keep telling the old sort of saying of, if you don't ask, you don't get. And you know, I've got nothing to lose asking. So I still don't ask really, but I do know in my, I know sensibly in my head that you can only ask and only be told no and it's not that bad so just ask ask away but um luckily for me i've had i've been lucky in respect of lots of people have offered to help me rather than me have to ask them for, for instance max glass is um like he's been a fantastic sponsor and sponsored me all through my tt and right from then until now and he's he was absolutely brilliant and i think it's only really the virtue of the fact that he pestered he pestered me that the sponsorship sort of happened because i was pretty awful at pestering him so he's been brilliant yeah he's my best my best sponsor I've had in one year I think it was in um when you were racing uh British superbikes that you would have been the first woman to win it but there was a change in the point system or how they did it so you actually ended up coming third instead can you sort of talk us through what happened in in that year and how that all all came about yeah, that was um, the British Supersport Cup Championships. That was my Supersport 600 bike. Yeah, unluck- just unluckily for me, that, that year they had a, like, a different points scheme. So previously it, hit, it had been 12 rounds and you get points in every round and it just accumulates and obviously whoever's got the most points wins the championship. But this season they it was um, we dropped, I think it was three, three of the rounds you could drop. It was either two or three. So basically there's three of us sort of fighting for the championship. If you added it all up and we all competed in all 12 rounds. So it was, it was sort of a fair deal. Um, if you added it up, yeah, I, I got most points because they deducted 
two of the rounds. It was sort of an attempt to make it a little bit cheaper. So, you, you know, you had the option of not turning up at a couple of races if you didn't want to, just to save a bit of money. They did up like your worst results. Yeah, I ended up third. But I still chuffed the bits to get third. And um, it was a really, you know, it was a good season, good championship and dead happy. Managed to get one, one race winning that and quite a few podiums. I mean, it would have been brilliant to have the championship as well. I was you know, slightly gutted that they changed the rules for that year, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, it was it was a really good season. And um, the guys I, I was racing with were really cool. So, and, and when you when you are racing, this is all this is all mixed. This isn't like do, is it? Do they have like female only racing or not? I don't. I don't know. No, they don't. Um, yeah, there's not enough girls doing it really. There needs to be a few more girls coming in. There's quite a few now, so hopefully, you know, there'll be there'll be more and. But to be fair, I quite like the fact that there isn't a girls girls only stuff. We're all in together because it's one of the few sports you know where you can all compete together, and I I quite like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's amazing. So, so you said there's sort of more women coming into the sport. Why do you think that is now? Uh, I think it's just natural progression. Um, maybe because they you know you, they see all the girls in it and they're like, well, cool, I can go and do it. And um, I don't know really. It's just not as it used to be where. It seemed to be only for blokes. Um, I don't know. I've no. I have noticed actually lots of the young girls that come come up to me like in pit lane and stuff. The dads, are, the dads are like, oh, she's like, she's better than a brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna get her a bike when she's old enough. And yeah, some of the girls are really, really, really good and really keen for it. So and yeah, having the parents' support as well helps a lot. So I'm sure there'll be a lot more girls in the future. So what would you say to sort of girls who are out there listening who maybe want to try out? try out motorcycle racing and get involved in it what advice would you have for them definitely go for it i found it to be extremely friendly and everyone's dead helpful and yeah don't have any inhibitions about doing it definitely if you you want to have a go definitely go for it it's quite cool that we can all jump in together and definitely nothing stopping anybody from doing it so go for it one of the things that i read about you on your on your website was that you actually started your own racing team yeah for um british superbike i mean i've always run myself anyway but you kind of need a defined sort of team for british superbike so it was one of those things sort of similar to the working in the workshop thing i, I thought i'm never going to get in superbikes unless i have my own team to get myself in there so yeah i just basically bought a an ex super superbike from another rider and then yeah set up our own superbike team with steve my business partner he he was like my main mechanic and had max glasses sponsor and and what, did, what, what did you call your team? Uh, we called Two Wheel Racing. So our workshop's called Two Wheel Workshop. So it's sort of a different version of that, Two Wheel Racing, so, like the racing side of the workshop. <laughs> awesome. And how did you find running like your own team? Like I said, I'd, I'd always run my own bike anyway, so it's very similar to that. It was just sort of a bigger kind of effort and a lot more to do. It's it's really busy. There's so much involved, actually, that that goes on behind the scenes in all the logistics of keeping it all going. Um, it's tough, but... To be fair, it's what I'd always known. It's what I'd always done. So it wasn't anything particularly new to me. And it was just a case of keeping it all going. And um, I enjoyed it. I do like having my own little team and I've, I really, really enjoyed it. I, I think it's just absolutely awesome that you've gone out and done this by, by yourself and by actually creating your, you know, your two-wheel racing team. You, you became like the first ever, ever female British superbike team owner. You're doing all this racing going incredibly well. You're getting loads of podiums and you're, you're winning races. What's next for you? From running my own team, obviously, the, the next sort of step was the proper cool step of um, being asked to ride for Honda. So being a Honda rider for last season and then again now in 2016. Yeah, that's sort of the ultimate dream come true where you know, it's the best, probably the best team in the paddock and one of the teams that I've admired for ages and for them to ask me to, to join their team last year and this year again. You know, that's where I'm at now and so how that's did, what I'm looking forward to. So how did that come about then? I basically had a, a meeting with... Um, Nick Campolucci, who's the head of Honda Motorcycles UK, and I thought it was because I'm run, I ran a Honda myself as, in my privateer team, and I thought it was sort of maybe going to be a, an offer of help to run my own bike. Um, so I had a meeting with him at and the motorcycle show at the NEC, thinking yeah. I'd maybe get some spares or a little bit of assistance with setup or some suspension, a little bit of help, and I'd kind of a, had kind of a list of things to ask for. You know, in the meeting he said to me, you know, how would you like to ride in the team and I I didn't play it cool one little bit I just, <laughs> burst, I just burst into a massive grin and I was like I'd actually love to ride for the team and and then I sort of thought well maybe they're gonna you know give me a bike and I'll still run it myself in a different garage but he was like well no if we're gonna if you're gonna come and ride in our team then, you know we're gonna do it properly and you'll be in our garage and 
we'll look after the bike and it, you know, you'll be, it'll be the proper setup. So yeah, I couldn't believe it. You know, it went from me thinking it might be a little bit of help to actually riding in a team. And like I say, yeah, I didn't play it cool one, one bit. I just, <laughs> I couldn't stop grinning and it was a definite yes. I'd love to. So, so what does that actually, that actually mean to ride for the team? Does that mean that they pay you a salary, give you a wage, give you all the equipment? How does that work? Yeah, it's just basically they, they've run it. So it's their bikes. It's run from Honda HQ, like the racing HQ, which is in Louth. And they've got um, their workshops there and all, everything that I had to do running my own team, which was looking after the bike, you know, logistically getting the bike to and from the track and even, you know, coming down to painting the bike and engine rebuilds and all that, you know, it's all taken away from me. I don't have to do any of that. So the team completely do everything, every prep, prep and what's needed. To, um, to look after the bike and I have two mechanics and a crew chief during a race weekend that look after the bike for me and help me just just means I can concentrate on being a rider rather than also looking after my own bike which is you know it's a massive relief of workload if you know what I mean so oh, absolutely it must be it must be actually a huge amount of freeing up all of your time so you can actually just focus on just the riding and not have to worry about anything else so that's absolutely awesome so you've you, you've signed with them again for for the next season yeah so back with them with uh, 2016 with the same teammates I've got Dan Linfoot and Jason O'Halloran as teammates and we go testing March the 7th we go so we have four day test in Monte Blanco in Spain and then we're off to Almeria in Spain which yeah I can't wait for that'll be good to get going get bum back on the on the bike and get a few laps under our belt before we we kick off in April so when you're not racing when you're like you're, when it's off season what what do you get up to what do you do uh, well, this year I've done a huge amount of training, to be fair, because um, I sort of noticed that I needed to improve my strength, um, upper body strength quite a lot. As soon as the season ended, it's like kind of October last year, I've just jumped straight into a bit of a training programme and trying to improve my fitness. So it sort of never ends. As soon as one season finishes, you're, you're kind of already thinking about the next one. And that's what I've been doing pretty much all over the winter. And I will carry on for the next couple of months just to get ready for April. You mentioned previously, it's sometimes, you know, it- is obviously as you're riding the the bigger bikes like a thousand is it a thousand cc am i saying it right yeah yeah Yeah. so as you're riding like the the bigger bikes it takes more energy when you're trying to brake and it's more concentration and you've got to be fitter to be able to do that what type of fitness is that is it purely strength fitness or is it cardio fitness how does it what's what's works best for you it's a good combination of both. So it's um, cardio and strength. You need both and you need all over strength as well. So it's not just upper body. You need you need your legs as well because you kind of, you never really sit on the seat. You're sort of perched on your tiptoes for the whole time you're on the bike as, you, as you're sort of wrestling the bike from side to side. So yeah, you, you're sort of doing a constant squat <laughs> on, your, on your tiptoes and trying to pull the bars sort of left and right and hang on to the bike with your arms. It helps have good core strength, good legs and good upper body strength. And do you, do you ride much like off season or do you just sort of give it a complete break? I would ride if I could, but the weather in this country is not the, not the <laughs> best for, um, for track riding. Lots of the track day companies don't sort of run over the winter just because it's too cold. But yeah, try and do a little bit of motocross, so it's sort of a different dis- discipline, but just keeps you on a bike and do, I just do a lot of mountain biking. I really love mountain biking. So I've been doing quite a bit of that and yeah, quite a bit of gym work as well which is I thought would be quite boring but I'm actually really enjoying it so <laughs> like I say we'll get back actually out on the bike itself in March so yeah looking forward to that you're sounding like super eager that you can't wait <laughs> to get back and get racing again I can't <laughs> it's bad <laughs> the weird like the off season is really bad because all you're thinking about is the start of the season no, no, I think I think it's amazing because you've obviously you've got this passion and this love for the sport, which is absolutely, which is absolutely fantastic. Which is so you've got the 26, 2016 season coming up. What's the big focus for the season, or what's the goal for the season? It's always the goal is always just to improve on your previous season. So for me, it's just to try and get myself in the points. So to be top fifteen would be pretty good. What we'll do is we'll just kind of re- review my lap times from last year and make a little bit of a target you know, what improvement we hope I can do race by race and then try and progress. So try and work my way up, you know, if I can get to like 20th and then 18th and then maybe 17th and then get myself into the points. And then um, that'll be a good sort of goal and then work from there. Any other final words of advice that you have for our listeners? If you want to go and do something and have a passion for it, definitely go and give it your all. Like they say, you only live once, so definitely go and follow your dreams. Now, Jenny, if people want to find out more about you and your racing and what you get up to and everything else, where can they find you on the internet? My website, which is jennytinmouth.com, and I'm also on Twitter, which again is just my name, Jenny Tinmouth, Facebook and Instagram.
awesome that is fantastic i will be putting all of the links to everything we've talked about on toughgirlchallenges.com so there'll be links to jenny's website to her twitter and to her instagram so do go and follow her she is the leading british woman i would say in the motorcycle world so absolute inspiration and it's fantastic that you're doing so well best of luck with your 2016 season and thank you so much for coming on the tough girl podcast cool thank you very much sarah Thank you so much for listening to that episode with Jenny Tinmouth. What an absolute inspiration. This month, it's all about motorsports at the Tough Girl podcast. And if this is the first time that you've listened to the Tough Girl podcast, welcome. I'm so pleased that you've decided to join us all. Every week, I speak to a different woman to talk about the different challenges and adventures that she's done. We get to hear about her journey. We learn about top tips and get advice for those challenging situations that you may be facing at home. Last week, I spoke with the awesome Jade Paveley, who is a rally car driver from the UK. And next week, I'm going to be speaking with Marina May, who is a model turned stunt driver turned rally driver who races in Rally America. So new episodes come out every week. So every Tuesday at 7am, you can hear another episode of the Tough Girl podcast. We have over 40 episodes now available for download. So, so much amazing content from runners to rowers to sailors to adventurers to polar explorers. Go and check some of the previous episodes out. It was really fantastic talking to Jenny and I learned a lot of things and a lot of things resonated with me personally. I especially liked it when she talked about in 2005 when she was when she was broke and having this really tough tough time. But what I loved and what I respected so much was how she kept at it. She kept showing up. She challenged herself to complete that year. She challenged herself to get to the races even though, you know, she could barely scrape the money together to even pay for the petrol. But she did it. She she overcame those challenges. And so many people in a similar situation could have said, do you know what? It's too tough. It's too difficult. I may as well give up now. Nobody's helping me. Nobody's supporting me. It's just me having to do it all by myself. But she didn't. She kept at it. She kept, she kept showing up and she kept on learning. I mean, I bet that that was the season that she learned the most about her mental toughness, about her resilience and also the reason why she was doing what she was doing, it was because that she loved it and she was passionate about it. And that actually she realized if she was going to make this happen, then she had to keep going and she had to try harder. She had to fight for it. She had to fight for every single step that she was taking. Success that Jenny's had and the, you know, the, the Guinness World Records, things like that do not come easily. It's, it's a journey and you've got to keep making progress every single time every single day as you go after your own personal goals and 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 go after the your big dreams and your big challenges one of the other things that resonated with me as well is how she talked about how she didn't like asking for money and although I'm quite a confident outgoing person you know I'm not shy about about talking to people or you know chatting or anything like that but what I don't like doing is actually I don't like asking for money and sometimes I'm very bad at asking for for help But I'm going to follow in her footsteps because I am looking for a sponsor for the Tough Girl podcast. And I would love for people to get behind the podcast and to help support it to to grow and to to allow me to interview more women out there and get to share their stories. So what I've done is I've actually created a page on Patron, which is a website where people can go and donate to support creatives if they create content. So you also get rewarded when you sponsor somebody. So there are different tiers, if you like, and different different levels of rewards available. But I'm not sort of asking for huge sums of money. It's not like, you know, come and give me £250 or whatever else. How this works is it's very sort of similar to crowdfunding. So it's about individuals contributing, whether it's a dollar a month or $2 a month or $3 a month, whatever that you can really afford, because it all adds up. So if I have 50 listeners of the podcast who all sponsored me $2 a month, say, the cost to them for the year will be $24, so less than £20. But for me, that would be generating over $1,200, which would be, you know, a great sum of money, which would allow me to expand the podcast. So it is worth thinking about. So if you're an individual out there who's enjoying the content of the Tough Girl podcast, and you want to listen more, and you want to support um, all of these incredible women out there, and also support myself, then please do and go, please do go and check out the page at Patron. 
p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash tough girl podcast the links are also on my website toughgirlchallenges.com and it would be absolutely amazing as i say it's not huge sums of money it's one or two or three dollars it's whatever you can really afford so please do go and check it out and um, finally i always do mention it but the tough girl tribe is full of incredible listeners of the tough girl podcast it is such an awesome group of women who are out there living their lives going after challenges going on adventures planning trips and just training hard and they're out there and they're supporting each other which is so amazing to see so if this sounds like you and you'd like to connect with other listeners of the tough girl podcast then go on to facebook and search for the tough girl tribe this is the only place i mention it it is only for the listeners of the tough girl podcast so it is a very exclusive community and finally just to say a massive thank you to everybody who's been listening a massive thank you to everybody who's been subscribing who's been writing reviews who've been sharing the tough girl podcast with their friends absolutely fantastic i've been having record downloads at the moment and we recently smashed through twenty four thousand last week which is absolutely brilliant um twenty five thousand this week absolutely insane so we are well on the way to reaching the target of a hundred thousand so thank you so much for your support i will be coming back to you next tuesday with another fantastic episode of the tough girl podcast when we speak with verena may and learn more about her journey and how she changed from being a model to being a rally car driver absolutely fascinating so have a fantastic week if you do want to reach out to me and contact me i'm always on twitter my handle is at underscore tough underscore girl all in capitals so just send me a tweet it will be amazing to hear from you have a fantastic week and i'll speak to you soon